Greetings, comrades. My name is Demorora, and welcome to a uh, apology, I guess, for what happened to tutorial number one. <laughs> but today <laughs> we are talking about how to set up a pretty basic advanced cannon. To be honest, it won't be the best, but it will get the job done. So here we are on our giant test raft once again and we're going to start off with the basics so this will be I guess explained in another tutorial so I won't explain what I'm doing right now we just gotta set this up and boom so we are going to make a turreted gun now this can be done in multiple ways but I'm going to do the standard way of a one axis turret now we have a turret and we can control this turret. We can control which direction it is facing, and it doesn't go... It doesn't have the uh, y-axis. But it does have what we need, and I do believe... Nope, I was wrong, it was just my zoom. Now, to start off with an advanced cannon, you have to have a firing piece. And a firing piece can be kind of hard to tell which way it is facing, but the bottom has two little prongs on it and the front is slightly curved. So this is facing the right direction and we can tell when we put it down. So this is the front of your gun. Now th everything revolves around this firing piece. Absolutely everything you do on this advanced cannon will revolve around what you do to this firing piece. So let's start off with giving ourselves a true gun. Now, let's say we want an average elevation gun. So this would be your relatively average naval gun. It has a little bit of up elevation and a little bit of down elevation. So elevation and depression, let's see, here it is explained. You have an azimuth, which is, as I was saying, elevation and depression and with the different types you have different well different extents you can do some are specialized such as this and some are kind of I guess relatively standard so this is standard elevation it does not give you very much side to side but that is not what you're here for However, if you do want side to side, you can do an omni mantlet. Omni mantlets provide equal y and x axis, I guess, turning. But we're going to do an elevation mantlet since we already have turning covered by our axis. Now, let's go back in and let's talk about barrels. There are three types of barrels to work with here. We have the standard barrel, a muzzle brake, and a bore evacuator. Now, these all do different things and I will explain. So let's start by placing a bore evacuator. I like placing a bore evacuator right in front of the mantlet or directly in front of the advanced firing piece depending on what type of gun I'm building. But since we're building this type we will put it in front of the mantlet. So let's plop this down. Now dim, what does a bore evacuator do? A bore evacuator reduces the cooldown time of the cannon because in real life a bore evacuator prevents the flow of dangerous gases from going back into the gun. So, this effect does not stack. If I were to place another one down, it wouldn't work. So you can only have one of these on the gun. Now standard barrels are standard barrels. The more you have, the more accurate your gun will be. And, well, the more accurate your gun will be. <laughs> so, place a couple of these down. You can tune it later once we talk about that, and at the end we will have a muzzle brake. A muzzle brake lowers gun velocity, but it reduces recoil. So it's a give and take, unlike the bore evacuator. The bore evacuator, I would say, is kind of a needed. It does everything a standard barrel does, and it reduces one or 0.1 cooldown. So, I mean, you shave off 10% of your cooldown. Why not? This, I do believe, let's go over here, it reduces 5% of your muzzle velocity, but it reduces 10% of your recoil. 
So it's good on some guns, but if you don't like the cosmetic of it, which it does get kind of awkward when it, the gun gets bigger, as you can see by this full scale version, yeah, it's really up to choice. Now that we have our gun and barrel, let's show this off. As you can see, we have full range of motion. We don't have very much elevation or depression because we have a one meter mantlet, but we do have full rotation either direction. Now let's continue working on our gun. So, if you're wanting to build a very, very simple gun, what you can do is take one of these ammo input feeders and slap it on the side of the advanced firing piece. This connects directly to something I will show later on. But for right now, I'm just going to pop that off. That's just a little tip. Now, let's go to the next standard. So here, we have gauge increases. Gauge increases do what they you think they do. They add more gauge. So we started off with a 60 mil gun. Plop this on, we get a 120. It does not scale perfectly, so as you get bigger, the scale gets different. And you can see the size of our gun changing. So we're going to stick with a 120 mil just for purposes of tutorial. Now, we will slap on one of these. A gauge increase splitter has, as you can tell, an input and two outputs. The input has to be facing on a line connected to, well, the advanced firing piece. So, say I put this, if I do this, it will still be connected. However, if I were to try and put one of the inputs it doesn't work. So you have to have the input side, or I was many, meaning to say output, if you mean to, eh, if you want to put this properly, you cannot have an output facing towards an output. You have to have the input connected to the back, which thus must form a chain which you can follow to the firing piece. Anyways, after that wonderful scene of blabbering, here is a gauge cooling unit. These are very, very useful. They have a, an effect that stacks that if you place multiple on a gun, they reduce the cooldown time of your gun, so thus it can help with reload. It is not designed to help with reload, but it definitely can help with it. So now we have two gauge coolers connected to a gauge increase, which is thus connected to a firing piece. So the gun still works. Still your standard gun, still spins and everything, and because it's on a one axis it doesn't matter how far we build down, as long as we don't collide with anything in the hull. So we still have our standard gun. Now, to make this a functional gun, there are several things we can do here. So let's talk about autoloaders. Autoloaders are an interesting thing that help you load shells, if you could not tell by the name. So let's plop one on this gun. Now this is a standard one meter, but you could also do a belt feed, and there are several different sizes. It's recommended to use the smallest size possible for your gun. Otherwise, you're going to have issues. Now, this autoloader isn't good by itself. So, we need to put an ammo clip on it. A solid and a standard are the exact same, but solid helps reduce lag, so I use it on all of my builds. And now, you have to put the input directly on one of the sides. So both of these are currently are currently connected. However, this one is not. So you have to have the wide end facing that. But we're going to take it off of that for now. Now, these aren't good for anything until you come back out and get this ammo input feeder. Now these can attach to any of the green surfaces you see on this, and they help increase reload time the more you put down. You really only need one to start a gun going, but let's put on several to get the gun flowing. Now these aren't good for anything until something later. Now let's continue on with our little gun. Let's do two little fun things. So here, this is only good for when you are controlling a gun, but this is a fall of shot predictor. Plop this on the gun, it will tell us where the shell will go once we have a shell loaded. Now you can connect this to any place that, as you can tell, is green, so I can plop one up here too. Be a little bit redundant, so I'm not going to do that. 
but it's best to place it as close to the gun elevation as possible, so usually one above is just fine. You could also do it to the side, that is another very nice place to put it. Actually, I will keep it on the side. Now we'll talk about the laser targeter. The laser targeter helps with fuses. It only does specific fuses, but it auto-sets fuses for airburst shells. So you can really plop this anywhere. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to slap one back here, and it still works just fine. It does not have to be pointing directly out of the gun, as you know the name would suggest. It is a laser targeter. It can be facing in any direction and still work fine. Now, let's go on to another thing. Here, we have hydraulic recoil absorbers. Now, these little suckers help it so that your gun doesn't tip your damn ship over when you fire it. So, we're going to plop on a couple of these. There we go. And that reduces our recoil by a slight amount. Now, the bigger the recoil, or the bigger the thing, yes, the bigger the recoil absorber, the more recoil it absorbs, as it, you would probably guess using common physics knowledge. So, using fours wherever possible is very nice, but if you're just trying to fit into a cramped space, ones and twos work just fine. Now, let's continue on. What else can we do with our Gundam? Well, right now we are going to have the ugliest gun ever, so we might as well make it worse. Here is a railgun. We shall make this gun a railgun. So we need to be able to connect one of these sides directly facing outward of the gun while having one of the sides either on a gun... I do believe it does have to be directly attached to... Yes, it does have to be directly attached to the side of the firing piece. So you must put these above priority of other things that you could put here. Now, this is next to useless until we slap on some of these. With these, you need to be careful. Once again, you have an input and an output. Be sure to put the input on the side facing that. So we will, I guess, make a barrel length long one. Now, this does kind of affect how powerful your gun is. The more you have of a railgun, well, the faster your shell goes. So if we were to, say, coat this on all four sides with, say, railgun attachments, then this would be a very fast shell. Honestly, this shell is going to suck anyways, because this is just a demonstration. Now, as you can tell, this railgun isn't going anywhere. Now, why is that? Well, the gun can't charge itself, so we need to be able to put one of these chargers, making sure the input is connected on one of these. And there we go, we start to see it spin. Well, after the coughing fit from hell, I'm back. And we shall continue. So the more you put on this gun, the faster it will charge. Now right now, it's not really charging anything because, well, there's no shell loaded, so it's just giving the animation. As you can see there, the magnet, even though it is placed over here, will rotate around the entire barrel and give a blue lightning effect to the barrel. Now, this gun is one ugly bastard, but it will not fire. Why is that? Well, we need to develop a shell for it. Now, here's where some simple math comes in. We need to return to the hole and use what are called customizers and controllers. So here, we have our basic controller. As you can see, it looks kind of odd, but you place it down and it still looks odd. It's called the Flak Monkey Mark 9. Now, here's where the fun part begins. You have ammo customizers, which give two modules or a single module version. Now this, you need to connect the input side to the flat face, as flat as you can really get, the flat face of the controller. And you can put as many of these down as you want, but you have to adjust your shell, your autoloader and ammo clip shell accordingly. So since we have a 120mm gun, you are allowed one module. So how to... F actually, let's just take a complete tangent off of this. How do you figure out what type of autoloader length you need? So we have a 120mm gun. What you do is multiply the number of modules by the gun caliber. And if it you get 1,000 per... well... 
you get 1,000 per meter. So we have a one meter clip. So we are allowed, let's see, if you divide 1,000 by 12, you get roughly, I don't know, let's see, eight? Yeah, you get eight. So you get up to eight shells. So we can do an eight, or we can do a four long chain, which will give us eight modules. Now here's where the fun part begins. As you can see, we have different types of, well, shells. So, let's start off with our casings. Our casings, we have gunpowder and railgun. Since we have a railgun, it is good to put one or two on this little gun, but for purposes, we're going to put one. Now we have two gunpowder and one railgun. The railgun only works in railguns, but increases the energy to speed conversion and accuracy. So these are standard, but we will get a bonus from this. You don't have to do gunpowder, but it really helps with speed. Now, moving on, we can do a shell rear. We have a graviton ram, which is an interesting one. This incre or this exerts torsional force depending on your uh, velocity of the shell. Now we can also have a base bleeder, which increases velocity of the shell. We have a visible tracer, which increases the accuracy of shells fired after this, which can be used in autocannons very well, and we have a super cavitation base, which removes slowdown due to water. This is only really good for submarine guns or such, or hunting submarines. So, to just for, I guess, purposes, we're going to put a base bleeder on this. I would have gone graviton ram, but I don't think we're going to really use the one for this. Now, let's move on to our middle. Middle is where it gets fun. Now, as you can see, we have a whole variety of things from things to choose from. We have an HE warhead body, a solid warhead body, a sabo, flak, a gravity or gravitational compensator, smoke warhead, an EMP warhead, an inertial fuse, altitude fuse, a proximity fuse, penetration depth fuse, a time fuse, stabilizer fin body, a shape charge secondary, and a frag warhead body. Now this may all be kind of holy crap, but you know it's simpler than it looks. I say that with a grain of salt. Now, let, since we are using a oh, laser targeter, we should use a fuse. So there are, available to us, five fuses. We can do an inertial fuse, which is very, very good for disabling shields. We can do an altitude fuse, which is semi-reliable, but sometimes explodes before you want it to. We can do a proximity fuse, which is very unreliable. We can do a penetration depth fuse, which is very good for if you are trying to do an APHE shell. Or we can do a time fuse, which is very good for, I guess, reactive flak. So we are going to do a time fuse because of what we used. So we will have a time fuse, which will be auto-set to its proper, I guess, time. Now, since we are doing a somewhat flak shell, let's do a HE body and a solid body. Now both of these have different modifiers. HE reduces the armor piercing and kinetic, but also creates a really big boom. However, solid increases sh speed, shell health is something I will cover later, increases armor, and increases kinetic damage. So we're having kind of a mixed thing here. Now we will also go for, in the front, Okay, here's where we need to start. We have a ton of fronts to choose from. Now what do we do? For this, I'm going to use an AP cap. But I will also later go over all of these because this would be too long of a video if I described every single frickin' shell in, like, very, very high depth. So we're just going over the basics of what there are. So there's casings, rears, middles, and noses. So here we have all four. So this is a very good shell. It's an average shell. It's not a very good shell because it could be done better, but this is a tutorial. 
I will go over expert stuff later. Now, we have our gun. I was about to do it without describing what the hell I was doing. We have our gun. We don't have any shells. And there's no shell loaded. How do we fix this problem? Well, let's just go right into here and select the controller that has your shell and then if you want every single intake on this gun to have this type of shell you do assign all but if you are something like I don't know what my new version of the Alliance has you want a different type of shell so you can do individual shell types but for now there we go and look at this now we can see all kinds of stats we have railgun usage, which is how much power the gun uses. The shell base speed, we have almost reached one kilometer a second. And here's where we can see the benefit. If you look at loaded shell base speed, you see 999 meters a second. However, you see including railgun speed increase of 647 meters a second. This is provided by the spinning railgun and by that singular railgun casing we have in there. So, mixed shells are very good on railguns. Now, we have a cooldown that we can't see right now, so that's kind of a problem. We will have to fire the gun once to show that, and we have a very high recoil force. As you can tell, what we have loaded is not enough to ensure that we're not going to get blasted in the next plane of oblivion when we fire this gun. We have an inaccuracy of about one degree, which is kind of eh, but it's better than what it could be, and we have an effective range of around 8.7 kilometers. Effective range is when the shell speed actually starts to just rapidly drop off and becomes next to useless. We also have our shell health and detection range, which I will go over in a different video and we have the maximum components which doesn't really matter so let's give this sucker a fire as we can see the laser or the fall of shot predictor shows us exactly where our shell is going and this is why it's very good to keep it at or around the level of your gun so we shall fire this insanely awkward round and now we can follow this round as it flies as you can see it is gone insanely fast and it is losing speed very slowly but now it is beyond effective range and is losing velocity rapidly it still has a very high armor pierce and there is the timed fuse going off it was set for 15 seconds and it did its job perfectly and now we can see the cooldown the cooldown of this gun is three seconds that doesn't sound good but it is actually just fine as you can see with a railgun, as the railgun charges up more and more, we are already using the maximum power we can, but letting it charge increases the shell base speed and increases effective range. Also, if you are not fully charged, then you're having a slight problem and you might want to get that checked out because you have horrible inaccuracy you do horrible amounts of damage and your range is pathetic so yeah it's good to let this thing charge up as much as it can so here's our basic advanced cannon there's nothing to uh, exactly write home about but here we have it so if you guys did enjoy this tutorial I will definitely be doing more of these in the future I have uh, quite the series planned out and well I'm hoping to do all kinds of wonderful things about From the Depths because I am getting back into the game and I am very excited about it. Also, these will be definitely daily fillers. So, as always, if you would like to see more tutorials in the future, leave a like, leave a comment, I'd love to see it. As for now, Demorora, signing off.